Okay. Who would like to? Okay, I think you want to do the first one, right? <laughs> Oh, I don't even know what it is. I, I don't have my notes. Oh, you don't have yours. Okay. Brandon? You want to do the first one? Honestly, um, I tried to call Fred for the cases because I, I don't have the book, and that's how we get the cases looking up, and I got nothing from him. I apologize. All right. Kate? Okay. Kim and Ephraim, Humane Legislation versus Richardson. Um, page 682. Um, the porpoise fishing is a particularly effective manner of taking yellow fin tuna. Um, that are incidentally, that incidentally kills dolphins by capturing and subsequently drowning them in nets. The Marine Mammal Protection Act of 1972 is meant to protect the dolphins from this type of harm. The Secretary of Commerce issued a permit to the American Tuna Boat Association that generally allows um, por porpoise fishing. Several animal advocacy groups challenge the regulation. The lower court declares the permit void because the act requires an environmental study that declares an optimal animal population and the number of permitted dolphin takings. Um, the court held that the Marine Mammal Act is meant to protect animal populations not meant to balance animal and commercial interests. The act does not expressly prohibit um, porpoise fishing. The act does require the secretary to publish a to to publish to public a study of protected animal populations and the number of animals permitted to be killed while still effectively maintaining that population. Uh, in this case, no such study is complete. More evidence should be introduced to determine the questions of population and permitted takings. The injunction was stayed and... Wait, so what's the issue? What the Marine Mammal Act is meant to protect. No, more specific than that. It's going to tick me off because it's like the Navy thing all over again. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, you know, the, the Navy can keep doing what they want to do, and, and that's great. But these guys are supposed to publish a study. They're supposed to get, mm -hmm. you know, what's the population supposed to be? How many can you kill and still maintain the population? You got to do the study first. But you know what? Since you've already been doing all this, doing the fishing, and it works really well, that's okay. Don't worry about doing the study. You don't have to actually live up to what the act tells you to do. You can just keep doing your fishing and continue to study. You know, as long as it doesn't go on longer than 10 years, then we're okay with it. Mm -hmm. Which is plus, it says in the case they they even actually understood what how much the damage would be and how they would affect the, the population. Well, yeah, I mean, they, they said, and they had numbers, I think they had from, like, what, 1972 population. or 1975, yeah. and there was yeah. 100 and something killed one year. And, and they knew they were going to kill them. Yeah. yeah, and they knew that they were dying. Well, doesn't it say, um, is it 70 per, per outing every time they put the net down? Yeah. It was every, 70. Every, every time the per se nets were set. 70? Um, on average, 70 dolphins yeah. were killed in 1971. On average, 43 dolphins were killed in 1972. This is each setting of the net. 19 dolphins on average in 1973, 12 dolphins on average in 1974, and 17 dolphins on average in 1975. I mean, in some of these years, it was, you know, a quarter of a million dolphins are getting killed. Yep. But they talk about the livelihood too, right? Like, they say, say in the case, the purpose of the statute was not to shut down the industry. Yeah, but you know, I guess, I guess this is See, why... That's, that's the Navy all over again. Well, this is why it rubbed me the wrong way, because there is another... Like, okay, there's a less profitable but effective way of fishing for these animals that people did for, I don't know, probably since they clipper ships, right? They used a line, and they used well, a hook, they the and they fishing. paid them. Yeah. You have to do it with a line, you can't do netting. Yeah. I mean, this is, you know, I mean, this is... Certain times of year. This, this method is sort of like, you know, it, 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 it is targeted at killing dolphins. I mean, that's, you know... This is a crappy way to fish. They like, don't care. They don't care. Yeah. They don't care. Right. Yeah. So we have this Marine Mammal Protection Act. Why do you think Congress created a, an act just for a certain type of species? Like, why do marine mammals have their own act? Is this another form of speciesism? Or is there something else at play here? Well, they talk about the sustainable population, right? They want to make sure they don't become endangered, right? 
but you could say that of any, many animals, I should say. So why is it specific to them? Mm -hmm. Why did Congress choose to protect marine mammals? They could become extinct. Hmm? They could become extinct. But they That's what I just said, but she said any animal could become extinct, so why do they? I mean, it says in the book that the act was founded on concern that certain, certain species of marine mammals were in danger of extinction or depletion as a result of man's activities. And that there was a common belief that those species should not be permitted to, to diminish below their optimal sustainable mm -hmm. population. Right. right. But we have the Endangered Species Act. Now granted that was enacted a year later. But why do we have one act just for marine mammals and then the other act that encompasses everybody else? industry. Also, too, I mean, marine mammals are a very small portion of sort of the fauna that are, that are in the ocean, right? There aren't many marine mammals, you know, as compared to, you know, fish. Right. And so, I mean, it is a very delicate ecosystem that they exist in. And, you know, any small changes could wipe them off of the map very, very easily. And they're a very unique and intelligent form of life. I mean, I'd like to think that that was the motivation behind mm -hmm. why they chose to protect these animals. Okay. Well, Patty wanted to just move the snail darter to somewhere else. I was just thinking about the snail darter. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't we move the whales and dolphins with them? <laughs> so, maybe, so maybe it's the population yeah. in the habitat, right? Yeah, yeah. Could be. Could be. Well, we saw the owls and the trees, and then the, the concern for them was the habitat, too, their trees, remember? Yeah. Yeah. Now, if you look at... Um, page 691, note 8, there's an exception that the Marine Mammal Protection Act doesn't apply to those taken by Indians, Alouettes, or Eskimos under certain circumstances. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Maybe because they don't use the, the and worst they, type of... Well, I think there was, I mean, with that, there were, you know, cultural considerations to that, which yeah. a big part of it. Yeah, I mean, they would, they would they could kill a whale and live off of it for the entire winter, mm -hmm. which is a pretty big thing. But I think also, too, I mean, it was a relatively sort of archaic method that they use of, of hunting them. I mean, they use canoes, and they paddle out, and they line weight, and they spear them, and they, I mean, it's not like it's a giant fishing vessel and speedboats yeah, that they're right. using to corral. Well, they said they have a, don't whales. they have a, a boat that pushes them out or something? Or? Yeah, but I mean, if you've ever seen, like, the, 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 the Inuits, like, they have these little, they have canoes, like, they, they fish in canoes, like, I mean, these, they aren't, like, commercial fishermen, you know? Oh, I don't know. Does it apply to commercial fishermen? I don't, if, if they're Inuit and they're commercial fishermen, are they? It says under certain circumstances, so right. I don't know what the yeah. circumstances are. So I would say that that's when they're out fishing in there, you yeah. know, in, a, kind of in an archaic manner, pull. you know? Yeah. Well, it's like, you know, in the hunting regulations, right, they break down the weapon type. So if you're using a black powder, which only has one shot, then you can pretty much hunt you know, the entire season, you know. Except Whereas that applies it, to everybody hunting. Right, right, right. This is but, just applying to certain nationalities. But I think, so do you think if someone, do you think if, if um, a woman from North Dakota of Irish ancestry went out in an Inuit canoe? Went out the land. Went out in an Inuit canoe and hunted a whale, do you think the law would prosecute or do you think it's, is the legislation for the lifestyle? I think it's probably for the lifestyle and not for the, the nationality, you know? It just seems like an obvious con law yeah. issue here. <laughs> Why? Well, not about that. <laughs> also, the, also, the number of kill at one time, they're, they're going out to get one. They're not, going, they're not killing 70 at a time. Right. Right. All right, Patrick, do you want to do Kreps? Sure. Thanks. Um, so there's a, a seal importer, and uh, they want to get seals. Uh, well, you can't kill seals in North America, right? We know a lot of clubbing. 
um, the Marine Mammal Act protects them. So, but they still do it in South Africa. And so, um, the Marine Mammal Act is very specific in the way it prescribes what can be taken and what can't be taken, and you know, all of it turning again on this um, sustainable population. So, uh, this seal skin importer wants to bring in I think, 10 or 15,000 seal skins in the United States from South Africa. And so they apply for a permit that would allow them to do this, you know, around the law. And so the secretary, and I think it's it's the, sort of the designee, the secretary of commerce, on all these, right? So when they're saying the secretary, it's okay. right. So so some person made up a regulation and said, you know what? We've done a study. We know that 70,000 seals, baby seals, can be clubbed to death in South Africa, and that's perfectly sustainable. So so long as. Uh, only 70,000 seals are clubbed to death in South Africa, then you can bring them in. Uh, oh, by the way, also, you can't club to death seals that are younger than eight months, and you can't club to death seals that are still nursing. So they looked at the seal population, and they said, okay, so as so long as there's 70,000, then you're good to go. Well, it turns out in 1975, there was more than 70,000 clubs, so the permit was void, and they couldn't bring them in, but the way it was decided, the way the court decided it, the permit could be sort of, re it was an open permit, it was sort of reapplied for. So 1976, they come back and they apply for it again. This time they win, and they want to bring in 13,000 seals. And so this comp the group of agencies that had fought them the first time come to fight them again. And so the court looks at it, they consider the regulations that were made by the secretary. And so um, they didn't like two things that the secretary did. So the 70,000 club baby seals was okay. That wasn't a problem, you can club 70,000 seals. Um, but what the secretary said was, we know that there are that up to 50% of the seals that are clubbed can be younger than eight months and will allow it because we're going to use the mean age of all of the litters that were born during that spring as opposed to using the actual age of the pups that, that were clubbed. And the court says, no, the act doesn't say that. Congress never specified that. That's, that's not allowable. And then the other piece of it was they, the secretary's designee decided that there was something called obligatory nursing. Um, and, and non obligatory in other words, they use non-obligatory nursing, or necessary nursing. Mm -hmm. um, and so, if the pups were, even though the regulation said no nursing pups may be killed, um, the, the, the government said, well, you know what, some of the pups are just nursing because they like to, not because they need to, so if you kill them, that's okay too. And so the court said, no, you can't say that, that's not what the regulation says. You know, you did the population study, that's okay, but you have to comply with the rest of these rules. Um, and these, the, the other of these folks, the challengers of the importers, they also challenged the way the pups were killed. And they said, you know what, there was enough evidence presented for the court to determine that the pups were clubbed to death in a humane manner, which is That's an oxymoron, isn't it? Yeah. Clubbed to death in a humane manner. So they, I mean, essentially what they really said was that you have to follow the exact strict specifications of the act in this instance. And if you're even one step outside, then no, you can't do it, and there's no permit that can issue to import these green maples into the country. Yep. So take a look at note one. Right, so the court agreed with the fishery service that taking more than one blow to kill the seals was not necessarily inhumane. Is that consistent with the statutory intent? testimony that two blows was almost as humane as one blow, and so therefore it's, I mean, it was a judgment call on the part of the trial court, right? Um, so I mean, does the statute, the statute says humane, right? It doesn't say kill with one blow, does it? Right. Yeah. Least so possible degree of pain and suffering practicable. Right. For the club. And so there was testimony that two bashes of the club on the baby seal's head is the least. Is, is somehow you made. So here we go. And what about the other point in this note about the emotional argument about killing babies? Were there other plausible arguments for the prohibition? Well, I think there's the, the 
um, like the mating nature, the migratory nature of the seals, right? So if they go someplace to, to birth seals and their babies are killed, I mean, seals aren't dumb. Are they going to go back to the same place? One of the reasons why they can birth in a place like that is because there are so many numbers. And I know the killer whales eat seals off of the beach, you know? And so there's safety in numbers when they do their, you know, when they do their, their breeding. So if they drive them out of this area, perhaps there isn't another suitable area to doing it. So I, mean, I can think of. Okay. I don't know if I'm totally off the mark, but. There's no right or wrong answer. Just there right or wrong. When I think about the clubbing, there was a show on, um, must have been Frontline or someplace in, in Africa, they showed women, um, they were allowed to kill cats. And, that's what they did. They clubbed it to death. And they allowed it because that's they were eating them. So just cats? Cats. Cats. Like wild cats that could kill them. But they had to do the same thing they do is club and they could only hit them so many times. But they would pick so them up. What, and what do you do? Them. Right, so you, you eat it twice and it's not dead. It's just like bleeding and half conscious. And that's why it right, smash the skull in. So the next case, Animal Protection Institute v. Hodel. In this case, the defendant was placing horses for adoption with the knowledge that they would then be sold for commercial slaughter. The court said this violates the act, which is to protect the animals, the Wild Horse and Burrows Act, sorry, if you have your book. Um, that this violates that act, which is there to protect the animals, and in the absence of qualified, but only in the absence of qualified adopters, they should be destroyed humanely. What do you think the reason is for the law existing in the first place? To prevent English slaughter of horses. But is this another example of speciesism? We have another act protecting wild horses and burrows. Just those two. So, but there is a similarity between the wild horses and the burrows and the marine mammals, right? Because there used to be wild horses running, and mustangs used to run mm -hmm. the great right. wild and great plains. I mean, only because people introduced them there, but I mean, that they used to, and they did for hundreds of years, right? So they were all captured or hunted or killed, or a lot of them were nuisance because they graze in the area where you want cattle to graze and things like that. So they were, you know, hunted, caught, captured, shipped down almost to extinction. Right, so they decided they wanted to reintroduce them like they did with the, the gray wolf, right? I think they're talking about that's mm -hmm. almost no longer requires protection any longer, at least at least not in the, in the western part of America. That's an excellent example. Why don't we have a gray wolf act? Right. Well, but is there, but what, the how are they protected as endangered species? Is there an overriding endangered species act that offers protection to something like the gray wolf that wasn't available back in 1971 when the Free Horses and Burrows Act was, was enacted? I don't know. Yeah. Um, it's kind of the same thing, though, right? I mean, it's you have something that's relatively rare. You don't see them everywhere. And so, obviously, there's someone in Congress that has an interest in these horses. And so they want to. Ah, OK. Right? Someone in Congress has an interest in these horses. Might it be more than that? I mean, when you think of the settlers in the West and that, when you think of. Um, you know, America in its early stages. Don't you see horses in the picture? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Aren't, aren't horses kind of an icon? In, integral oh, part, part, of the, yeah. part of the whole mythos. Mm -hmm. Doesn't it say something about because they're being exploited for commercial purposes or something? But there's, they are for the slaughter, but there's lots of animals being exploited for commercial purposes. You know, alligators in Florida. So the court, while it restricts the secretary from adopting animals out to individuals who express an intent to sell for slaughter, okay, so that's prohibited. There's no duty to find out whether that intention exists. So they don't really care. <laughs> yeah, well, it's like I a don't, don't ask, don't tell. <laughs> yeah. Wait, but right? I, I don't necessarily, I don't, I don't know that I agree with that because there's that year probationary period, right? And a horse is not inexpensive to take care of. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I mean, if someone's, it's not a viable commercial enterprise to care for a horse or a group of horses for a period of a year only to get title to it so that you can go and slaughter it. Okay. Right? I mean, I, yeah. I think that there's an argument for that. Yeah, I think fair that's, point. You know, that, that's, so yeah. it's not, 
I don't think it's horrible. I think it's kind of crazy that that there isn't. Oh, well, I guess once you transfer the title of the property, how can you? Right. You should be writing into a contract, right? I mean, yeah. Why couldn't you write into a contract that if if there's knowledge, there's actual knowledge, knowledge is being used for commercial purpose, then you're then you forfeit the right to the property. Although then I guess once the animal is domesticated, what's the government going to do with it to put it down anyway? Mm -hmm. Right? Huh. <laughs> well, when you look it up, it says um, this is like um, Department of Interior Bureau of Land Management, and one of the things the thing that flashes up is own a legend. In other words, that's Wild West in America, and mm -hmm. adopt a living legend. Do you want to do it or do you want me to do it? No, I'm happy to do it. Okay. Unless you want me to. Hmm? Unless you don't want me to. No, go ahead. What's the name of it? Uh, Fellini v. Fellini Hodel. Fellini v. Hodel. Um, so there are ranchers, uh, cattle ranchers, and they have a permit issued in 1967 under the Taylor Grazing Act that allows their essentially grazing rights on public property to these ranchers and, and their cattle. So under the permit, they're allowed to drill a well on this property to supply water to their animals so long as what the court defines as, quote, wild, close quote, animals are allowed to use the water. And so when the permit is issued, there are like 130 wild horses on or near this land, right? And then the, the Horse and Burrow Act of 1971 is passed, right? So 20 years later, now there's like almost 2,000. And so um, the ranchers install what are characterized as high guardrails on the property, um, and the ranchers call them gates. Mm -hmm. And so um, the government, and I think it's the, the Bureau of Land Management. That's probably what it was. That's right, what the, the BLM. horses were up under. Yeah. yeah. They just saw. So the, the Bureau of Land Management says, wait a minute. It says right here that you can put these up so long as you, and you use these wells so long as you allow the wild animals to use them. So the ranchers say, OK. So I guess they have like 15 or 16 different sites. They take them down on all but one. This one site called Deep Well. And so they don't take it down in Deep Well. The Bureau of Land Management says, we want you to take it down. They, they don't do it. They challenge it in court, at which point the Bureau of Land Management revokes their permit. Um, so now they go to court. And so uh, the court holds, the trial court holds, that when the original agreement was made, the horses weren't considered sort of among the wild fauna considered at the time of permitting, right? They were thinking about like hogs and just like smaller type mammals and, and you know as sort of proof of this is that you know they didn't really contemplate 2,000 horses grazing and using all the water in this area because that doesn't make it usable for, um, for cattle and so they say no you can't yank their permit they are still within the rules uh, the, the hide gates can stay um, and so the appeals court looks at it and uh, they said yep the lower court was absolutely within their discretion they didn't agree with it or not but they said the lower court was within their discretion um, that the 1967 Taylor Grazing Act agreement did not contemplate wild horses and they, they affirmed it. And then there was a dissent, and the dissent was, I forget the justice's name, essentially said, look, this is an act of Congress, and so you have to look at Congress's intent when they were talking about the act, and there was nothing in either the Taylor Act or in this new Horse Act that said there was anything as a, you know, any such thing as a, you know, quote, status, close quote, a status quo, close quote. Of what, of what constitutes wildlife. Wildlife is whatever wildlife is living in the area. So he didn't like it. And this really is the only one that, I mean, this one kind of deviates, right? I mean, it, it seems like it deviates from some of the other stuff that we read. So does this decision square with the Wild Horse and Burroughs Act? Or Free Horse and Wild Burroughs? No, absolutely not. not. Absolutely not. But then the question is, you know, what's the optimal population of horses, right? So 130 is too few, is 2,000 too many. You know, at what point do they become, does someone decide that they become a nuisance animal, right? Because some other congressman's ranch starts getting chewed down by all yeah. these horses, and all of a sudden, you know, you, you can shoot them again. Yeah. You know? Yeah, how do you do that? When you protect something, they become 
Well, from everything that we've, from everything we've read, you establish what an optimal population is, and you decide what that population can be maintained at, and everything else you can kill. So now we have a case where the court is saying horses, these horses are not wildlife. Bringing right. us right back to the beginning of the course, where what's a wild animal? Right. Well, and they, I mean, really what it says is, is it's not, I mean, they are wild. Well, they, these are obviously wildlife, yeah. but they weren't wildlife in 1967, so therefore, yeah. ex post facto, we can't you know, apply this. Yeah. Good job. All right, so your final exam will be probably next door.